Oh, oh there we go. Okay, yeah. Like it took a second to first click and then magically it just Okay, good. All right. And so Sweet. You are up. Can you have a moderator who will come in and introduce you? Okay. A, a in person moderator? Okay. Person moderator. All right. Real Not human. a virtual. <laughs> a real human. Okay, so I'll hang out. If there are questions, you can just repeat them. It. Got it. That would be amazing. Okay, I can do that. And this is just on, or is there an on off? It might have been, yeah, so the slide's up. So that's on. Yep. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, audience. <laughs> Hi. Um, briefly, I saw him. He kind of was walking by. And then he, I asked him, like, do you know where I'm talking? And he, like, told me where I was talking. And then he, then he left. He had bright shoes on, very bright neon shoes. <laughs> he had, like, orange neon sneakers on. I'm like, wow, you're well spotted. <laughs> huh? Well, I, th I, you know, there might be one family. I ran into one of my kids, and they were like, "We'll see you later." So maybe it's okay. It was a. <laughs> well, it's like. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. Oh, I guess this is new then. I never really, I feel like it's been a, I haven't been since Virginia Beach. And I wasn't talking then. Yeah, I didn't, I tried to sign up and I could, like, it was messing up on me. I got the hotel saved, but it's kind of like a weird thing because Montreal is like the weekend, but the week before Ron has to be in Toronto for a meeting also. So it's like, we're, <laughs> we're going to go back and forth. So I don't know, but I, oh, well. <laughs> It's all about Canada this year. So yeah, I had, um, I submitted like uh, two things for the. Yeah, I have a feeling you're in on the end. I have a feeling you're in on the end. <laughs> yeah, I think I was in practice like when they did the first one, I was only like a year and a half or two years, and I put like three or four, and he's like, more, do more, do more. Harold was like, put more in. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's ancient history. Hi. I am. Uh, you Harold, am? Harold is busy, and he's supposed to be. Oh, I was supposed to be. Oh. <laughs> this is my kid's version, though. I mean, she did Lelia's epithelial plate. I'm sure that's the official name. The growth. Oh, the growth. You did, you did growth plates twice. I did the eight, eight plates. Oh, yeah, there's going to be eight plates in this talk, but you and know all about them. Yeah. I have eight plates at home. Both children <laughs> have done eight plates twice. Yeah. That's a Jake's fun first surgery. surgeon in Chicago, Dr. Diaz, little Brazilian guy. He's like, I'm like, screws? <laughs> I have eight plates and screws in a bag. I'm like, here, Jake, this is what was in your legs. Man, I didn't get a chance. You didn't let me keep anything. I'm like, this is not a bomb. Hey, how's it going? Good. Nice to see you. No, if you could do this next. Hey, Jalen. Well, I mean, this is good. Hey, how are you guys enjoying your week? I got you. <laughs> cool. 
Yeah, well, it's awesome. It's quite a thing, huh? Yeah. They put on a show. Awesome. Well, have fun. Are you gonna Are you gonna uh, see fireworks tonight? I don't know. I don't. I. I, guess they should. <laughs> I guess there's some going on somewhere around here. Uh huh. All right. Well, that's fair. Oh boy! Oh man, I I um flew I literally from Alaska. Yeah, from uh, what it was time a, did you leave? Well, it's four hours earlier there, and it was Alaska. Time zone. They have their own. Yeah, and so it's an hour earlier than California. So my flight left at 10 p.m. Alaska time, which is 2 a.m. East Coast. Okay, you can. And then, uh, but the flight's only five hours, so you only sleep four hours. And then, um, yeah, then up, you just get into a good sleep. Then. Yeah, and then there's a short flight to Atlanta, and where they teased us and said, "Oh yeah, you got upgraded to first class, and here's your special breakfast." But oh no, there's too much turbulence, and you don't get breakfast. So I was staying up, thinking I was going to get like my special breakfast, and then they're like halfway through, they're like, "You know, actually, you're not getting it. Here's some pretzels," and I'm like. Dude, I could have slept for two hours. Right. And so then I get here and I feel like I need to run around and get things organized. <laughs> Meanwhile, my boyfriend's been asleep in the room. But at least they let us check in early. That was nice. Yeah, we didn't have to wait till like four o'clock. So I could like get the road dust off me. I'm gonna wait one more minute. Oh, look at that cutie. Mm. So is this gonna, that's only for live stream, this is for here. I believe so. Okay, so I'm not gonna like. No, I don't okay. think so. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I guess five o'clock is technically evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for this session, Dr. Sarah Nasov, who is the orthopedic surgeon at the Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. And today she'll be presenting about lower extremity deformity in arthrosis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nasov to the conference. Hi, everybody. So I see some familiar faces and some people I'm just seeing for the first time. Thank you for coming. Happy July 4th. I'm going to talk to you today about a pretty broad topic called lower extremity deformity. So it's kind of going to be a little teaser, a little taster. Um, I'm uh, the director of limb lengthening and reconstruction, also arthroposis at the Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia. And uh, I will start with a little summary slide about what we're going to talk about. This is a lot, there's a lot of detail in this presentation. If you have a question about what I'm saying, if you want to like, just raise your hand and let me know. I'll stop and I'll try to make it more clear. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is what is lower extremity deformity? What types of lower extremity deformity might we see in arthrogoposis? And how can we improve it to help kids walk better? And like I said, this is, this is kind of just a primer. So a little bit about me first in case you don't know who I am. I grew up on Long Island, which is in New York, close to New York City. And then I went to school, Binghamton University, for college, where I was an art student. I was a painting major in college, actually. And that's one of the pieces of art I did when I was a student, self-portrait of me. And uh, after school, I ended up actually working at the Folk Art Guild as an artist for a while before I decided to go back into medicine, which is another PowerPoint. It's a separate PowerPoint. 
And since then, in the 90s, my family relocated to Alaska. So actually, I'm, I flew from Alaska last night to be here today. I was visiting my family. So that's a picture of my family and the Aurora. They live in Fairbanks. And so I did have to go back to school to get my medical training since I was an artist first. I went to uh, Goucher College uh, where I did my pre-med. And then I went to UNC and Chapel Hill for medical school. And I did a five-year plan there where I did some research. Then I did my residency learning about orthopedic surgery of all types at Michigan, University of Michigan. And finally, I did my pediatric orthopedic surgery fellowship at CHOP in Philadelphia. And that's kind of how I got to Philadelphia. And uh, that took 13 years in one slide. And so now I'm at the Shriners. And this is kind of an old picture. This picture was taken in around 2016 when I was just starting in practice. You can see everybody's hair is a little less gray in that picture. And I put little ribbons over the people who you may have seen talk today, although I heard just moments ago that Dr. Zlotlo, due to illness, was not here. <laughs> but that's me and Dr. Zlotlo, and that's Dr. VB, and Dr. Kozen, who some of you may know also, who does some arthrocoposis work too, and Dr. Pays, who you may have seen for spine stuff. And I work at the Shriners Hospital Philly, as I've said. I also have a relationship with the Erie unit where I go once a month. So I'm flying to the other part of the state once in a while. I have a clinical appointment at Jefferson where I'm a clinical assistant professor. And I actually have an appointment with the Spokane Shriners. So when I was up in Fairbanks just this last week, I was actually doing an outreach clinic with them as well. So, and I do an outreach clinic in Puerto Rico too, because that's kind of the, what Philly does. That's like the Philly thing. To, so we see a lot of kids from Puerto Rico as well. And I also, because we're adjacent to Temple, I, I do have a relationship with Temple, so I'm all over the place here. Oi, let me advance it here. All right, but no matter where I go, there's always kids with arthrogoposis. Every place, every one of these places. In fact, more than 50%, maybe more than 60% of the patients I see have arthrocoposis. And so I see it a lot. And it's inspired me to do a little bit of research. The things that I have cooking lately, in case you're interested in, include these three projects, including looking at blood loss in kids who have had surgery in orth orthopedic surgery, trying to see if there's differences that compared to other kids to see if we can make surgery a little bit safer. And then also looking at kids who have had like really bad knee flexion contractures who may have had uh, a type of surgery that doesn't always have great results, and then how we might be able to fix that. So that's something we're going to be presenting in Montreal. And then uh, also a new project is looking at gait patterns using gait analysis and seeing how kids with arthrocoposis move, and then also to try to see if there's a connection between having really bad hip contractures and, and scoliosis. But today we're going to talk about deformity. And so deformity really is a general term that can mean anything that's a different shape than normal. This x-ray demonstrates what a normal side view looks like in a kid who doesn't have any condition, really, the one that says normal side view. There's a little bit of a bow to the normal femur on the side view, but you can see the other picture shows a bend that's in the complete opposite direction, right? And there's some hardware in there, too. That's a kid with arthrocoposis that had a treatment when they were very young where they changed the shape of the bone, but when it was, they were too young to have that done, and it, and it outgrew and it grew in a, in a very unusual way. And also, the knee contracture by which this was meant to treat totally recurred. So there's like a 100-degree knee flexion contracture in this bow. So that's definitely a side view deformity there. So why does deformity happen? Sometimes it just happens, and we don't exactly know why. We call that idiopathic. Sometimes it's because you've had a fracture, and you know, it heals not the way it was in the first place. And sometimes it's iatrogenic, and we say that um, usually when you've had a procedure or something else, and like maybe it wasn't intended, but you end up having a bit of a crooked shape to it. Sometimes it's intentional or pathologic, like you might have rickets or Brock syndrome, where you might have another reason to get deformity, or dysplastic. Maybe you've had a contracture for like 10 years, and then that changes the shape of the joint. Now that's a deformity too. And that picture right here, that's a kid with OI. This kid doesn't have arthrocoposis, the other pictures do. Uh, but you can see how the, it's sort of bent in a funny shape and that from multiple small fractures. So how do we know it's normal? 
We have these schematics, which I am not going to test you on. There's a lot of numbers on there. But we use this as surgeons to try to figure out where the problem is, because the problem can happen anywhere on the bone, and actually also in the soft tissue too, which you can't measure directly on these schematics. So there's a front view bunch of measurements, there's a side view bunch of measurements, and, and this is kind of what we use to compare others to, to understand how far off you are, and maybe how you would make it right again. This is a zoom in of one of the legs. Uh, there's something called a mechanical axis that can tells us, tell us what is most balanced. And if you put a little dot in the center of the femoral head, that's that blue circle all the way on the top, and you put a blue circle in the middle of the ankle at the bottom, you connected that with a line, it should go in the center of the knee. And if it's perfectly lined up, which not everybody is, even people who walk just fine, it's not exactly perfect. But if it was perfect, it would be right down the center. And that helps us sort of understand what normal is and how far off from normal you might be. So let's talk about what abnormal might be. Well, I sort of mentioned that there's a front and side view situation going on. We have doctor names for these things. Uh, front view problems are called coronal imbalances, like knock knees or bow-leggedness, and I'll describe that a little bit more. There's also side view problems, like most commonly in arthroposis, like knee contractures, but there can be other changes that happen. And there's also rotational problems, which we call axial issues. What may be normal for a kid without AMC may not be good enough for a kid with AMC too. And that can be really complicated to figure out. Also, sometimes maybe in some circumstances, a child with AMC may tolerate something a little bit more. But I think it's usually the other most of the time because we all know that it's a condition of poor muscle quality or quantity. And so you really want your balance to be pretty good if you want to be walking as well as you can. And so you may not a kid with arthrogryposis may not tolerate those variances quite as much. And we use gait analysis to help us sort it out. Dr. Heyer can help us with the gait analysis. <laughs> so this is, um, you know, coronal imbalance is that front view uh, difference. And this is a deviation from the mechanical axis that I showed you in the front plane. And knock knee is a common example. That's when, when your, the legs are together, the knees touch first, and where the feet look a little bit further apart. A little is okay and actually normal in a certain age group. And that picture shows a, a child without arthrogryposis that just has a little bit of knock knee there. That may not be a problem for anyone in particular. And you may grow out of it a little bit when you're very young. And this is an example of bowed legs. That's when you put your legs together if your feet touch first and then your knees are still apart. This is very normal in infancy for most individuals, but it can get to be a problem if it persists or if it's getting worse. And I've noticed that sometimes it's a discovered problem. If you have a kid with, you know, the really tight contracture and then you straighten them out, sometimes things can be unveiled with deformities that have occurred through time in the knee joint itself. And this is an example of that. This is a young lady who was adopted from China who had her knees bent until she was like 12. And then when we straightened them out using an external fixator, which I did a number of years ago, we noticed that she had just a tiny bit of bowing. And you see how that mechanical access line is sort of not through the center of the knee, but on the inside of the knees. And so we used guided growth plates to help her out because she was struggling a little bit in the beginning. But she like now does the Special Olympics stuff and she does great. I think a little bit of it is just confidence building in the beginning. So I said sometimes mild differences are no big deal, but what if they're not? What can you do? We think that it's a problem if it negatively affects ambulation or if it impairs brace wear. You know if you're wearing KAFOs and you have a lot of bowing, that can be really annoying and problematic to get them, the braces to fit quite well. And so there's a couple of topics I'm going to go over, how, how we can use guided growth, how we can use an osteotomy, which is a surgical cut, and how you can use that gradually or acutely. You guys following me OK? OK, good. So have you heard of a hemiepiphysiodesis plate? Can you raise your hand if you've heard, anybody heard of this? I know I'm using big words. You've heard, I know you've heard of it. <laughs> so um, physis is a word that refers to the growth plate. So that line that's like kind of in the bone by the joint, that's like where you make new bone from. And hemi means half. So we're putting a plate on half of that growth plate. Like it's a little confusing, two plates, but we use the implant on the growth plate. And this is opposed to an epiphysiodesis. That's a procedure where you shut down the entire growth plate so that you can slow down a leg that's 
longer so that the shorter leg can catch up. So that's a different surgery. We put this plate on one side of the bone and it sort of pinches the growth plate, slowing the growth on that side, which allows the other side to grow and sort of kicks the leg into a straight position. The thing is, uh, you can do this on any growth plate as long as you can get an implant to fix, but it doesn't show you a difference right away. So you come out of surgery and you just have a scar and everything looks the same at first. The pros of using guiding growth are you can be in and out of the hospital pretty quick and maybe walk on it right away. And it can be reversed if it went too far, and that's one of the cons. It can go too far. If you don't monitor it, you can get the opposite sided, you know, the opposite direction deformity. And it usually when you get to your straightened position, you then take out the plate and screw, so it requires another surgery, and you have to be growing. So if you're skeletally mature, you can't do this as an option. The other thing that doctors know and think about is that it's hard to correct more than one plane of deformity. Like you can only fix like the front view very well or the side view very well. Um, we're getting a little bit better at being sneaky with this, but it's most it's best for just one plane deformity. And here's an example of a kid who has arthrogryposis. You can see on the left, her mechanical axis is a little off. Those lines are outside the knee to the side. She'd had previous surgery. You can see those implants in. But once we got her all straight, we're like, oh, this is not exactly right. And she was still having some struggle with walking. So we decided when we took those implants out to put the eight plates in. So we stuck them in, and it takes a little while for them to kick in. I have my theories on why that's the case. But six months later, nothing much has happened. And those purple lines do pretty much the same as the red lines. But a year, year and a half later, those blue lines go right through the center of the knee. And so looks if you kind of look back at 10,000 feet too, the legs look straighter. So this was a nice way to fix, fix her contracture without making her sit in her wheelchair for too long. I mean, not contracture, her angulation. So the pros um, of doing an osteotomy, uh, which is a different type of procedure, uh, and cons are listed here. So like I said, a surgical fracture is like literally what sounds like you break the bone. You make a cut right through it. And sometimes it's not all the way through, but mostly through. And you can change the deformity right away. Let's say a gradual correction is not good enough. You're having problems. Two years, no, we kind of need to do something sooner. And so this is a possibility. And the pros are the correction is achieved immediately, uh, but you can't walk on it right away usually. And you can correct multiple planes of deformity at once, but if you have a really big deformity, not a mild deformity, but something like what, 45 degrees, something like that, you may require to shorten the bone if you're changing everything right at once. And that's because your nerves and blood vessels and all those other things, they don't take a joke when you try to stretch them too much. And so if you're really making something really crooked straight, you gotta be careful. So this is an example of a child with the AMC who had uh, this problem but was skeletally mature. They had genu valgum as well. They were not a candidate then for guided growth. They also had a couple of other problems too. One that the leg was a little bit longer on the side that had genu valgum. And then you can't see it on this x-ray, but had a tiny knee flexion contracture remaining. So we were able to do a bunch of things at once by using an osteotomy. And we used a plate and screw. So you can see the before, the lines on the outside. And then now the lines on the inside crossing that star, which is the center of the knee. And so if you look at this, this is my rough cutting and pasting of things to try to demonstrate how we did this. So we started with that x-ray all the way on the right. And this is how I, I think about it before I go in the operating room. I put a, a line down the anatomic axis, and I made a cut perpendicular to that. And then I made a second cut also parallel to the joint line. And that yellow part is basically what you remove. I think I took more out on this example than I actually did on her, but uh, it may be varying size. So you take out a trapezoid, and then you put it together, and the line's ma magically straight. It looks great. And so we shortened her, too, and put a plate and screws on there. There are uh, That's called a closing wedge osteotomy, so the bones touch, and it heals really nicely. But some people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've had surgery on that leg before. I don't want it any shorter. I see it's crooked. There's another way to do it. You can do an opening wedge osteotomy. This involves just making one cut, and then you wedge it open. And you stick in it. You can stick in a little triangular graft in there. You just got to be careful how much you're correcting and which direction you're correcting in. Uh, because like I said before, you don't want to do an acute correction, slam something too big, too straight. Otherwise, your nerves may hate us. And that gives you a little bit of length, not a lot. 
I don't know if you've seen talks earlier today that talked about external fixation. Do you guys know what external, have you heard of external fixation, X fixes? So these are those big contraptions that are on the outside of the body that look like a medieval device that um, is a bunch of rings or rails that have pins that connect to the rails and also go inside the body through the skin and hold the bone. So you can use this dynamically, meaning it just holds things in place exactly where you are, or uh, I mean that's static, or dynamically where you actually move the bits around and you can gradually change the shape. So this is the safest way to correct really big deformities and you can have a lot of flexibility with changing things around if you don't like exactly where you've got or you want to tweak it a little bit. So it's a very powerful tool. You can change um, bone osteotomies into different shapes and you can also change the position of joints, which is what you may have heard of before. The cons of this is a higher infection risk and that it's higher maintenance for the family because you've got to wash them, keep them really clean, and also a lot more doctor visits. This is an example of what an external fixator may look like in this situation. I drew this myself. This is a monolateral fixator on the side for simplicity, where you have a rail on the side, and then you have these pins that are held by little carriages. And I mean, you make just one cut, and then you can change the angle of the pins, you see, and make an opening wedge. And then let's just say that side wasn't just a little short, but a lot short. You can then spread those pins apart and drag the bone longer, and you can make more new bone, which is something that, that may be needed. And so that is a longer process, uh, but it is a powerful process. Sagittal malalignment refers to those side view problems. And so many times, like I said, you know, these are knee flexion contractures or other related issues. And this is a, one of the snapshots of that normal view on the side, that drawing, and then a really bad version of side view deformity. So we, would treat, we can treat these in a similar way. We can use those eight plates kind of on the front of the knee, and I know that's a terrible x-ray and it's really hard to see, but those plates are on the front of the knee from the side view. And uh, you can use these to gently correct the shape of the bone to make up for what's tight and soft tissue. It sounds weird, but it works for small contractures, although it tends to recur. So sometimes kids who have this, when you get straight, you take the plates out, and sometimes you have to redo it again. These have the same pros and cons as using the eight plates for the front view problems. And this is a child who had arthrocoposis, who had a small contracture. And you can see, this is a side view. His knee is facing actually to the right of the screen. So if you put a mechanical access line on it, it's behind the knee, meaning the knee is bent or flexed. And so we put these eight plates on, and a year and a half later, it's kind of touching the bone there. It's gotten a lot better. And clinically, he looks straight. So they're probably going to be removed pretty soon then. This is an example of using an osteotomy to correct uh, sagittal deformity. This is that same kid who had the front view that had the plate and screws and the big rod on the other side. At the same time as we corrected her front view problem, we created her side view problem. And you see how we put a little bend in the side to make up for her tiny bit of flexion contracture that was remaining. And so we made her mechanical axis nice and straight for her. And that was because she had some inherent differences inside her joint. And uh, this is only good in older kids. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Just because I've seen so many people come to me who have had this sort of extension osteotomy that they call it done when they're four years old, six years old. That's way too young. Because the growth plate tries to undo that. It tries to go back to its original position and it creates all sorts of strange shapes to the bone. So here's a cool video. I hope I can get this to work. This is actually a side view problem, but because she has rotational issues too, you kind of see the side view as she's walking forward. And um, it's loading up, so there it goes. Maybe I can get it to go one more time. So um, if the video isn't projecting very well, that image on the side here is what she ends up looking like when she gets all the way to the end. And this is hyperextension, but the legs sort of rotated out. So I can't hyperextend because I can't, but like just imagine it's, the knee is bending forward. You can do it? Oh, OK, we got an audience example. <laughs> sure, you can do it. You want to show us? <laughs> so OK, we, got, we have a live example here. OK, so this is where they're supposed to end. And 
this is where my <laughs> That's hyperextension. Thank you so much. And my elbows do it too, there, and then like, like Oh the boy. Like oh my gosh. So that's what this kid has, but at the same time, she's sort of walking like this. So she's like, I can't even do it, but she's walking with this leg forward. That's why we can see the side view problem, even though we're seeing her face. So uh, that's a, it is a side view problem. And so these are her x-rays and um, her knee is actually facing towards me now. So that purple line actually is going in front of her knee. So that's demonstrating an extension problem. And oddly enough, on the other side, well, I guess not odd because it's arthroposis. On the other side, she has a slight flexion contracture. And I wanted to zoom in on this just to show you what I meant by, you know, articular dysplasia. Look at how squared off those joints are. They're just not a normal shape. The normal shape is in that x-ray of some unknown child over here that I stole from the internet. Um, but it's so super round. And it is very flattened out in that kid. And, and, and it's stuck in the hyperextended position. So that's a deformity that you can correct with an osteotomy. And since she's a little too old, we could not use guided growth on this. And then this is an example of what we did. The, um, the dotted purple lines there show what a normal position would have looked like on her if she was able to get her legs straight. So you see, it's such a big angle there in between where her leg goes and where it should be. And you know, this was a tough case. We couldn't get perfect, but we got it a lot better. It made it a lot easier for her to walk. And that's the final view where you can see the red lines and the red dotted lines. It's a much more acute angle. So it's closer to normal and a lot easier for her to walk. And we were also able to rotate her so it li her leg isn't facing sideways. And then this is that example that I'd showed you a couple of times of that really backwards bowed leg and how we had to do um, an acute correction on that. And because it was such a big problem, we had to shorten it too. So you can see that leg looks a bit shorter, but a lot more straight. And although the flexion contracture definitely recurred a little bit, even though we got it mostly straight, she can walk where she couldn't walk before. So I think that that is a win. So rotational problems. Are you familiar with the term in-towing? You heard of that term? Rotational issues, typically makes it look like either your knees or your feet or both look like they're all pointing inwards like this or outwards like this. I'm pretty straight, so I'm just sort of forcing myself in that position, but some people can't move like they're sort of remain in that position. And it can come from your hips, like you can have a special version to your hips that you can see on physical exam as drawn in that diagram. Or it can come from your, a twist in the tibia, tibial torsion or even a position of the foot, which is very common in arthroposis because so many kids who have club foot have a slight residual club foot position that makes it look like their foot's pointing in, um, but it, you know, it's their foot. So sometimes you have to balance all these considerations. You know, which one is the biggest problem? And what, what thing would you like to change to make it gait better? And so this is an example of a really cute kid of mine, and he has rotational issues. Uh, I don't, yeah, it's working, yay. Uh, so you can see he has had previous surgeries and some of this may be a, a result from some of his surgeries, and, but he couldn't walk. He can walk really well. I'm sorry the video isn't working very well, but he walks really fast without any braces and without any walker, but it's hard for him to go fast because he ends up tripping over himself. And you can see on this other picture of him, kind of skipped ahead a little bit so you could see since the video wasn't working, that um, when he stands, you see how it looks like he's stepping on his other foot almost. Like his braces are sort of crossed in front of him. And so we, I'm giving away the answer here. The, the treatment for this may be what we call a derotational osteotomy, where you basically make a cut in the bone and then you twist it to the direction you want. And you can do this in the femur, you can do it in the tibia, and sometimes you do it in both. And braces don't typically work to fix this. Like you usually have to jump to doing something surgical. And uh, if you do this in the tibia though, it's very important to keep mind of the vitamin D level because I've definitely seen it in AMC that I'm not sure if it's a nutritional issue or not or absorptive issue, but if kids are a little low on vitamin D, they can have these like asymptomatic non-unions, meaning the bone doesn't heal very well, even if they, you know, they have a very normal course. You may have to restrict weight bearing for a little while because you have to cut the bone and then put that plate and screws on it. 
So this is what um, Oliver looked like right after surgery, he looking much more straight. And there he's ready for the tackle, uh, looking much more, much more straight. So in conclusion, lower extremity differences are common and they have many causes. And for kids with AMC, sometimes small changes can make big differences. I've shown you some big cases though. Some of these are big cases. Uh, sometimes kids who have arthrogryposis need a lot of help to walk well. Uh, and so sometimes uh, we have to do more than one thing or correct more than one problem at maybe more than one time. And there are different ways to approach surgical management to improve gait, each with pros and cons. I, I mentioned the guided growth plates for gentle movement uh, that you can walk on right away. Uh, surgical cuts that you can either fix with a plate and screw or an external fixator and sometimes use a special dynamic external fixator that can lengthen and do other things as well. Thank you all for paying attention. This is pretty dense. It's a lot of stuff to understand. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about anything I've talked about in this presentation, or if you have particular questions about your child or, or you, if you have questions about you. Anybody have questions? Don't be shy. All right, well, I guess you all know what to ask for now if you need it. And you're gonna know, you're gonna walk around, you're gonna see people out there and you'll be like, oh, that's knock knees. You're gonna not, you're gonna be telling people what you see. Well, I appreciate you all. I hope you have a nice July 4th. And uh, this is my email address here. So uh, if you have a question that comes up later, you're welcome to email me and I'll write you back. <laughs>